Prime Minister Justin Trudeau wrapped up an eight-day trip to China this week with a final stop at the G20 Leaders Summit in Hangzhou. The aim of the trip, he said, was to, quote, reset and revive Canada's relationship with the world's second largest economy. How did he do? Well, for more on that, in Waterloo, Ontario, Hong Ying Wang. She's Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo, and we're delighted to welcome you back to the program. Professor, how's it going? Good. Thank you for having me. Not at all. The trip, of course, by the current Prime Minister Trudeau did raise some obvious comparisons to a previous trip to China by his father, the previous Prime Minister Trudeau, when he re-established relations with China back in 1973. So how do you think the current Prime Minister's trip stacks up in terms of historical significance? Uh, I think the context has changed a lot. So uh, it's a little unfair to try to match the uh, previous Prime Minister Trudeau's visit. At the time, 1973, when he visited China, Canada had just established diplomatic relations with China three years before. And at the time, China was very isolated from the rest of the world, particularly industrialized countries. So Canada being among the first uh, major Western countries after France and some Scandinavian countries uh, certainly stood out and it made a, a very big uh, ground uh, breaking contribution in ending China's isolation. Today, China has diplomatic relations just about with everybody uh, in the world, um, but it's still, I would say, it's significant in a different way. Uh, it's significant in that uh, this visit early in the liberal uh, administration um, is a major, I think, represents a departure from the previous era uh, of Canadian-Chinese relations hmm. under uh, the Conservative government. Not to seem too superficial in this observation, but certainly much of the press coverage we saw not only among our own media, but among Chinese media as well, was that uh, China went gaga for the current Prime Minister of Canada. What'd you make of that? Um, I think it's all f for the good. Uh, I guess our Prime Minister has been uh, very popular almost uh, everywhere in the world, and China's no exception. Uh, there's been a lot of um, you know, enthusiasm um, toward Canada, but you know, also Canada represented by a, a young and, and promising leader, so that generated a lot of goodwill. On top of, uh, you know, that, he's the son of the previous prime minister, you know, who, from China's point of view, was one of the very early friends among Western leaders China had. So I think it adds something to uh, the goodwill uh, that Canada enjoys <clears throat> in China. Let me get you to weigh in on this characterization, which came courtesy of the Toronto Star's editorial page, in which they said, the expectations bar was set deliberately low for Justin Trudeau in his first visit as Prime Minister to China. Signing $1.2 billion worth of commercial deals with Chinese companies was a solid, if unexciting, achievement. Do you agree with that characterization? Yeah, I, I think $1.2 billion is not a big number, uh, but it is a, a very uh, good beginning. I think, uh, as you mentioned before, the purpose of this trip is really to re-energize uh, the broader relationship between the two countries. So while it is not exciting, it is uh, a good sign for things to come. So to that end, let's focus on what some of, I guess, would be described as the big news of the trip, which was the announcement by the Prime Minister that Canada was going to join the Asia Investment, uh, excuse me, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. A few questions on that. Number one, what does that bank do? Well, the AIIB uh, is a bank that China uh, proposed in late 2014 and uh, opened for members to join in the spring of 2015. Um, and the purpose of the bank uh, is to help mostly at this point Asian countries, uh, relatively low income um, Asian countries develop their infrastructure, so their roads, their uh, power supply, um, ports, and so on to help them with their economic development. Um, but it, it also represents uh, a, a very major kind of step forward uh, in terms of China trying to exercise some leadership in um, world uh, development, um, economic development in particular. Now we should point out that not everybody thought that this represented an enhancement or a furthering of the relationship between China and Canada. And to that end, let me read this 
from David Mulroney, who's a former ambassador to China, now at St. Michael's College here in Toronto. He wrote, the trouble is that China is unwilling to embrace the commitment to transparency, probity, and good governance that should distinguish the host of such an institution, the bank we're talking about. China jails lawyers and journalists, places its ruling party above the law, and displays a cafeteria-style approach to global rules, selecting only those that meet its immediate needs. Let's not forget that China's current contribution to Asian infrastructure involves the construction of military airstrips on man-made Chinese islands in far-flung parts of the South China Sea. Let me get you to weigh in on whether you think it's a good or a bad idea that Canada joined this thing. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying I think it's a very good thing that Canada has uh, joined, uh, or at least has submitted uh, its um, um, application to join. Um, I think it is very uh, important to recognize uh, that uh, the AIIB um, is a new institution, and because it is new, it is probably among the very few uh, development banks headed and mostly driven by developing countries. It is very understandable. The more traditional development banks, uh, the more traditional members of the donor uh, community have doubts what standards this new bank might follow, um, what level of transparency. So um, I think the ambassador's points are all well taken. Um, the issue is what do you do with uh, the power reality and the political reality uh, in China? I think uh, the alternative is to leave China to, um, first of all, feel upset and reject it. Secondly, uh, being by far the most powerful member uh, in this new bank without uh, any significant uh, counterforce or, uh, you know, other members that could uh, bring meaningful dialogue uh, with it. I think um, those options are not very good, you know, not joining or, you know, st uh, being critical uh, rather than engaging. So I think while it is true there are problems with domestic governance in China. Uh, what we see in the AIB actually is a very, I think, significant effort on the part of uh, the, the president of the bank, uh, Mr. Jin Li Chun, um, to try to make this a very transparent and a well-governed institution. Whether they succeed or not, it's very difficult to tell. It's still in the early days. But if you look at the staff, they have hired senior staff. The, the uh, articles of agreement and the outreach uh, program of the bank, especially the joint uh, financing of projects, uh, I think it is certainly um, a, a very good beginning. Uh, that sounds, uh, you know, maybe too opti optimistic on my part, but I think it is uh, an institution that is well above uh, what the standard one might have expected hmm. of a China-led bank. Let's stay in, uh, in that rough neighborhood for just one more question, sort of tangential to mm -hmm. what we've been talking about. Uh, shortly after the Trudeau trip was over, uh, North Korea, it has been reported, has tested another nuclear missile. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Chinese reaction was, um, to put it bluntly, they were not amused. Uh, what, what can we expect China to do uh, to actually get North Korea to behave better on this? Um, well, I think China, as, as one can imagine, being right next door to North Korea is, uh, uh, you know, very worried about a um, tension-ridden peninsula next to uh, it itself. And uh, China has long been caught in a very uh, difficult situation. It is really North Korea's only significant friend. Um, so the international community has for years been asking China to do more, but North Korea is not anybody's puppet. Uh, I think it is clear that the Chinese government has had a very hard time trying to bring North Korea to a, to a place that the world community would like to see. So, I mean, as you know, China has protested the latest uh, nuclear test um, and it is, on the other hand, not as uh, stern, I guess, uh, as some of the Western countries because China does have to live next door to this country and then you don't want to, from China's point of view, have a regime collapse which would lead to chaos and refugee issues and who knows, some other desperate action on the part of the North Korean regime. So I think China has to walk a very fine line, putting pressure without 
you know, provoking a major crisis next door. Understood. Okay, back to the Trudeau mission and the, the two, you know, delicate walks that the Prime Minister of Canada always has to walk in China are on the one hand trying to enhance trade relations and on the other hand uh, raising human rights issues. And Canadians, I guess the polls show, they're, they're fairly split on what ought to be uh, prime in any Prime Minister's missions when uh, he or she goes over there. Uh, let's just play a clip right now of Prime Minister Trudeau from the trip in which he discusses in one of his speeches China's human rights record. Sheldon, roll it if you would. In a world of rapid change, it is a diversity of ideas and the free ability to express them that drives positive change. And I remind everyone that as a country that has seen firsthand the benefits of free expression and good governance, Canada encourages China to do more to promote and protect human rights. In the global village, we all have a stake in what happens here. The success of the world is inexorably linked to China's success. What impact, Professor, do you think speeches like those have in China? Um, I think the Chinese leaders have been traditionally uh, highly sensitive to any talk by Western leaders, Western commentators, uh, influential commentators. Um, about China's human rights condition. But I think by now they've gotten used to it. They kind of come to expect, okay, so they all have to say that. Uh, so let's just, you know, let it go over <laughs> uh, this period and then we're back to business. So I don't really think that's anything that's gonna make a big impression on China's leaders. Um, on the other hand, um, I think, you know, it's very good that uh, Canadian um, leader, uh, the Canadian leader, was able to to express his concern and in a very positive way. Um, you know, from China's own point of view, this would really benefit the people and make China a stronger, uh, a better uh, member of the international society. So I doubt there is any immediate impact, but he certainly had put it in a very diplomatic way. It, didn't seem to have, um, you know, caused any major resentment on the part of China. Hmm. Uh, I suspect a great a swath of urban Canada uh, doesn't know much about the next subject that I'm going to raise with you, but uh, you can be sure that those who farm in this country and who sell canola uh, surely did care about it. And so I want to raise that issue with you because it looked like whether or not Canada would have access to selling its canola in China had the potential of derailing this whole mission before it even started. Can you, um, can you sort of set the scene for us there? What was the big problem that the Chinese had with our trying to bring more canola into their country? Um, this seems to be a little bit of a surprise, uh, actually, I think to people in the industry. Um, you know, it, it, it has been the case that China imports a lot of its uh, canola oil seeds from Canada. I think the number I saw is something like 87%. So obviously it's a big part of uh, Canadian-China trade. Um, and for Canada, this is also extremely important. Um, it is the second largest uh, exports Canada sends to China, and China is the second largest market. Uh, uh, you know, as a trading partner for, for Canada. So whether you're talking about trade broadly or canola oil seeds in particular, this is a major uh, element in the bilateral relations. So what I meant by surprise is that things had moved more or less uh, smoothly for quite a few years, um, and then this suddenly came up uh, before the Prime Minister's visit. Um, so actually, if you go back to 2008, uh, the Chinese did express some concern about um, you know, canola uh, oil seeds carrying um, foreign matter, uh, which may spread something called the black leg disease to mm. China's own rape seeds. Um, so then they invited uh, Canadian scientists who worked with them, and they came to an agreement that actually the chances uh, for the disease to affect Chinese crops were quite low. So they relaxed their rules uh, in 2012, uh, but then this suddenly came up this summer just before the visit. Uh, is a bit of a surprise. Uh, so I really don't know uh, the 
the, the background of why this suddenly became an issue, but just from an outsider's point of view, it seems to me that it could be about maybe protecting China's own um, you know, rapeseed growers, uh, or it could be about creating a bargaining chip just before a major visit. Well, that's what I wonder, Professor. Let me follow up on that yeah. because, you know, th there certainly were a lot of voices in this country that said, don't join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. And then Prime Minister Trudeau announced we were in. And I wonder whether or not, you know, there was a quid pro quo there. We joined the bank and they dropped their objections to our canola situation. That's that could be a reasonable guess, but you know I don't have any inside knowledge. But it, it just seems to me to be the timing is quite uh, interesting. Agreed. Okay, let's uh, talk for a second about free trade because there there was a lot of musing, I guess, before the trip that Canada and China uh, potentially were going to sign a free trade agreement, and then the issue kind of fell off the table uh, at some point during the mission. What do you think happened there? Uh, that's very. That's a very good question. Uh, so, so when the liberal government came into power, uh, as far as China was concerned, free trade negotiation was pretty high on the agenda. It was talked about a lot. Uh, but I think over the months, the specific commitment kind of became more generalized. Uh, so on this trip, as you pointed out, um, you know, there was no. Um, you know, no launching of a formal uh, negotiation process. The interesting thing is um, the table seemed to have turned a little bit. At the beginning, it was mostly the Canadian government uh, and policy community talking about the desirability of having a free trade agreement with China. China was a little bit reluctant or at least cautious for a while because of the uh, issue having to do with state-owned enterprises being barred from buying uh, you know, Canadian enterprises after the Nexon uh, mm -hmm. purchase a few years ago. Um, now it seems the Chinese are saying, yeah, let's get this started. Uh, whereas the uh, prime minister and his delegation did not make any firm commitment. Uh, from what I read, the ambassador, the current ambassador of Canada uh, in China reported the prime minister did bring, uh, did talk to the Chinese leaders about uh, free trade arrangements, but without committing to a formal process uh, of starting the negotiation. In principle, do you think it makes sense for Canada to try to get a free trade agreement with China? I, I think so, and I think this government is committed to that. Uh, so, so I think the general idea of having more trade with China is very appealing because, after all, China is the second largest trading uh, partner with Canada and Canadian businesses are very keen to sell products to China, break down certain barriers and so on. Um, I think the issue really, uh, I think behind Canada's hesitation of formally launching the talk now is, um, you know, whether China would agree to include certain labor standards, environmental standards, uh, and in exchange, would Canada have to give up too much in terms of letting in Chinese state-owned enterprises, investing in Canada? So I think the idea is a good one. The devil is in the details. Right, as always. Uh, we got about a minute left here. Let me put one more issue on the table, and that is parks. Uh, do you think Justin Trudeau scored any points uh, on the environmental front by agreeing to help China develop a system for national parks, which, of course, we're pretty good at here? I think that that's a that's a very very good uh, point that he he made, and I, I think it could only be popular. I can't imagine why, you know, people in China would would find that uh, not uh, welcome because many many Chinese tourists come to Canada every year, and I hear everywhere and read everywhere this is something that they they find really impressive are the national parks of Canada. So it would be wonderful that the two countries could work on something together in China on this front. And just finally then, you are a professor of political science, so I I'm going to ask you, Professor, to give the Prime Minister a grade. How would you grade the trip? <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. I'm not a very uh, tough grader, <laughs> so I would give him an A-. minus. The only thing that he didn't do, but maybe he couldn't have done, I think, is to make a more of a commitment to the you know, Paris um, agreement about uh, fighting climate change. Climate change agreement, right, which China and the U.S. signed, but for some reason Canada did not. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I hope your students aren't watching because they just found out you're an easy mark when it comes right. to grading their papers, but otherwise we hope lots of people did watch. <laughs> Professor Wong, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight as always. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. 
Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.